this time on Crime Inc. Ten years on, the Srebrenica massacre. Ronnie Biggs on the run. The police honey trap that caught an innocent man. And Russell Crowe's phone rage. But first, Roman Polanski. Academy Award winning director and actor Roman Polanski seems to have it all. A glittering career, beautiful wife, and a swag of the world's top awards for movie making. But behind the scenes lies a story of heartbreak and tragedy. The Polish born director spent his early childhood on the run from the Nazis, only to discover after the war that his mother had perished in Auschwitz. In 1969, his wife Sharon Tate who was seven months pregnant with their first child, was brutally murdered by Charles Manson's followers in a house in the Hollywood Hills. The event shattered Polanski, who blamed himself for being in London at the time. He attended her funeral supported by family and friends. Polanski admitted to feeling rudderless in the years that followed, unable to form lasting relationships. In 1977, he was involved in an incident that was to overshadow his career and force him to flee the United States as a fugitive. Polanski became sexually involved with a 13-year-old actress of whom he was taking a series of photos to boost her career. He says it was consensual. She says it was rape. But in any case, Samantha Geimer was under the age of consent. The case went to court and Polanski accepted a plea bargain that saw him agree to plead guilty to a lesser charge of engaging in unlawful sexual intercourse with a minor. However, he discovered the judge intended to disregard the plea bargain in his sentencing, which could have seen him jailed for up to 50 years. Polanski fled to France where he was a citizen. As France has a policy of not extraditing its citizens to other countries, Polanski was not forced to return to the United States and resumed his filmmaking career. But he still constantly feels questions from the media about his legal problems. I came here to uh, talk about the motion picture that I presented. It. I've been uh, traveling around the world for 20 years. I don't have any problems, thank you. However, the director does have to avoid countries that have an extradition agreement with the United States to avoid being set back for trial. In 2004, Polanski sued the magazine Vanity Fair through the British courts after it published an article that claimed the director has solicited a young woman for sex on his way to Sharon Tate's funeral. Giving evidence via video link from France, Polanski denied the allegations, saying they were the worst thing ever written about him and that they dishonored Tate's memory. Longtime friend Mia Farrow was amongst those who gave evidence in favor of Polanski. She told the High Court of his utter sense of loss at his wife's brutal murder. The 60-year-old star recalled a meeting with the film director at Elaine's restaurant in New York at the end of August 1969, the month 26-year-old Sharon Tate and her unborn child were slaughtered by Charles Manson's family. It was scalded on her mind, she told Mr. Justice Eady and a London jury. Sharon Tate's younger sister Deborah, who was 16 at the time of the murder, told the court she spoke to Polanski on the telephone in London after the tragedy. He was an absolute wreck, sobbing, weak in voice. I'm sure weak in physical body on the other side of the phone, she said. When she saw him when he came to Los Angeles, he was, she said, heavily sedated to the point where he couldn't walk without assistance. The magazine accepted that the incident did not happen on the way to the funeral, but argued it occurred about two weeks later. It claimed, even if its defense failed, Polanski should not receive any damages, as his reputation had already been affected by his 1977 conviction. However, Polanski was found to have been defamed, and Vanity Fair was ordered to pay damages of 50,000 pounds. All that is necessary for the triumph of evil is that good men do nothing, said philosopher Edmund Burke. Never was that more evident than during the Srebrenica massacre when the world sat back and allowed the slaughter of thousands of Bosnian Muslim men and boys in what was considered to be a United Nations safe area. 
Over just one week in July 1995, Serb paramilitary forces under the command of General Radko Miladic systematically murdered close to a quarter of the 40,000 strong Bosnian Muslim population. Soldiers and civilians, men and boys, were stripped of their personal identification and belongings and executed, their bodies hidden in secret mass graves. No one knows exactly how many people died in Srebrenica. Mass graves are still being uncovered, and forensic experts examine the remains and attempt to identify the bodies. It was the worst European atrocity since World War II and led to worldwide condemnation. But questions were raised about why the 600 Dutch peacekeepers in the area were unable to do more to help the Bosnian Muslims and why NATO aircraft could not provide the UN peacekeepers with better air support. By the end of the conflict, the entire Muslim population of Srebrenica had been deported or murdered by Serb forces. The International Court of Justice later classified the atrocity as an act of genocide. Ten years on, thousands of people attended a ceremony at Potokari Cemetery in Srebrenica to remember the victims of the massacre. 600 newly identified dead were to be buried after the formal commemorations. Amongst the mourners was British Foreign Secretary Jack Straw. For it is to the shame of the international community that this evil took place under our noses and we did nothing like enough. I bitterly regret this and I am deeply sorry for it. But the Foreign Secretary looked to the future and said a lasting peace between the different communities in the Balkans could be established. Tragically, ethnic hatred, mistrust and intolerance has long thrived too much in this region. And we have to create a lasting peace here by building mutual trust and understanding. That has to have a twin foundation. First, justice. Second, a shared future. Now, history has shown us that former enemies, however terrible the conflicts, can be brought together. Two Serb officers involved in the massacre have been jailed, convicted of aiding and abetting genocide and of crimes against humanity. Serb President Slobodan Milosevic was also tried on similar charges, but died during the trial, so a verdict was not reached. Meanwhile, at the remembrance ceremony, Muslim prayers echoed throughout the valley, a solemn and moving reminder that while what happened in the past will never be forgotten, now is also the time to rebuild and respond to the calls for a long, lasting peace. Coming up, escape artist Ronnie Biggs. In 1964, 13 men were sent to jail for a total of 307 years for carrying out Britain's notorious Great Train Robbery. But just four months later, Charlie Wilson broke out in an escape as daring as the robbery itself. A gang of men on the outside stole a builder's ladder to scale the walls of the mental hospital that lay next to the prison. Then they used a rope ladder to clamber over the 20-foot high prison walls, knocked two guards unconscious, and freed Wilson and three other prisoners from their cells using the master key. A huge manhunt was launched to find the fugitives, but it took police three years to track Wilson down to his hiding place in Canada. Great train robber Ronnie Biggs was similarly disinclined to serve out his sentence and plotted an escape that was to prove more successful than Wilson's. Mrs. Williams, will you tell us what happened at five minutes past three? Well, I was doing my housework when I, I did notice a green zephyr go up the road, took no notice, then a red van went up. I thought, oh, someone's moving. Then I heard an engine running, so I rushed out and got my handbag, thinking it was the baker to get a loaf. I get to the door and I see the red van is back and back onto uh, backing and the Zephyr following it. So I uh, stand there and I don't realize, and I think it's a, 
Nan's got a silk scarf over his head, tied on top, looked like a coconut. And I thought, oh gosh, it's a, it's a, it's a spring, it's, they're going to get someone out. And um, then they get a sort of platform on top of the uh, van, and something went over the wall, which obviously is a, um, a ladder. The man it was quite um, a stockily built man with blue overalls on, as I say, this silk stocking over his head. And you knew then it was going to be a, a Oh, spring. as soon as I see the masks. Then I look further along at the Zephyr, and the man there has come out, and he's got a silk stocking on with a scarf halfway on, round his face there, and a peak cap. And um, I notice he's got a, 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 a rifle, so I think this is where I go in. I go indoors and shut the door very quickly, bolt it. I don't know anything. What am I going to do? Because there's nothing I can do to help them. So and I, then what happened? I, I, so after a while, when I sort of calmed down, I went and had a look at my bedroom window, and I see two prisoners come over the wall. I only saw two. I must be. Uh, Pacific on that. How, I did how were they dressed, Mrs. Williams? Oh, in their in um, blue overalls and striped shirts. But while Biggs was getting away, Great Train Robbery Mastermind Bruce Reynolds, one of Britain's most wanted men, was captured in 1968 and served a decade in the slammer. On his release, he became a minor celebrity and published a best-selling book, Autobiography of a Thief. Biggs escaped to Paris, where he received a new identity thanks to forged papers and plastic surgery. In 1965, he moved to Australia under the name of Terence Fuminger and met up with his wife and children. However, after five years of living quietly under his new identity, the police closed in again, and Biggs was forced to flee to South America, leaving his family behind. As Michael Haynes, he forged a new life in Rio, Brazil, but received the tragic news that his eldest son had been killed in a car accident in England. He resolved to give himself up so he could return, but then discovered his 19-year-old Brazilian girlfriend was pregnant with his baby. Big stayed on in Rio, but in 1974, desperate for money, he was caught in a trap set by Scotland Yard detectives when he agreed to provide the Sunday Express newspaper with an exclusive story. However, the Brazilian government refused to extradite the father of a Brazilian citizen and ordered his release. In 1981, former soldiers of the British Scot Guards abducted Biggs. He was held on a yacht in the Caribbean while his jailers attempted to sell him to the highest bidder. Years later, the head of the operation claimed it had been secretly underwritten by the British government. There was much sympathy for Biggs, and even the train robbers who served their time were keen to see him stay free. I think they've taken a the man away from Brazil, from his child. I mean, when will he see his child again? He's got to do nine years imprisonment in his country if he comes back. Do you think he should come back and go to jail? Of course he shouldn't. Good luck to him. I'm choked that he's been captured. Barbados police eventually took Biggs into custody, but a court ordered his release. He was flown back to Brazil in a Learjet paid for by two television networks, keen to get the exclusive story of Ronnie Biggs reunited with his son. Biggs was allowed to stay in Rio, provided he reported to police on a regular basis. He eked out a living, cashing in on his notoriety, selling T-shirts and souvenirs, and starring in advertising campaigns. Biggs' young son, Michael, also helped out. Interviewed on television after the foiled kidnapping, he had performed a song and dance routine that caught the eye of a record executive. Michael joined several other children to form the Magic Balloon Gang, and their first record went gold. The group toured Brazil and made enough money for the family to buy their own apartment in Rio. However, some bad investments saw Big's financial situation turn sour again, and he was forced to resort to selling his story and playing up the media coverage of his situation. Biggs also claimed he secretly returned to England a few times, where he recorded songs for the great rock and roll Swindle, a film about the Sex Pistols, and collaborated on a documentary about the great train robbery. The Fugitive wrote up his life story in Odd Man Out and contributed to an album called Mailbag Blues that was intended to be the musical soundtrack to a film about his life. Biggs received support from some unlikely quarters. The 
The train robber became a tourist attraction for Britons visiting Rio, and he welcomed them to his home, where he was happy to have his photograph taken and provide his autograph for the bargain basement price of $50. In 1999, Biggs invited more than 100 people from around the world to celebrate his 70th birthday party. They included old cohorts Bruce Reynolds and Roy Shaw. The party went for a week, and Biggs said he had no plans to return home anytime soon. No way, no way. I want to be, be live and die in Brazil, and I want my ashes to be spread over Santa Teresa. But Big's health was fading fast after a series of strokes, and in 2001, he sent an email to Scotland Yard saying he was prepared to give himself up if authorities sent him a passport. Biggs arrived back in England on May the 7th, 2001, on a charter jet provided by the Sun newspaper, which paid his son Michael 20,000 pounds for the exclusive story. Although the media reported his return was due to a shortage of funds to pay for medical treatment, Biggs himself said he just wanted to enjoy a punt at a local club. But it wasn't to be. Biggs was arrested and taken to serve the remainder of his sentence. Although he spent the last few years petitioning for early release on the grounds of ill health, He's now in lower security Norwich prison, where he's awaiting the decision of the Ministry of Justice on whether to grant him a compassionate release. The great train robbery remains Britain's most famous heist, and Ronnie Biggs, one of the country's most recognized criminals. Coming up, Russell Crowe's telephone tantrum lands him in hot water. In the annals of British crime investigation, one of the most ignoble must surely be the wrongful prosecution of Colin Stagg. In 2001, Stagg was an unemployed man who lived quietly with his dog near London's Wimbledon Common, where Rachel Nichols' mutilated body was found on the 15th of July, 1992. The young mother had been taking her two-year-old son and their dog for a walk when she was attacked. The murder horrified Britain, and there was immense pressure on the police to get a result. After interviewing 32 suspects, police narrowed in on Colin Stagg, who was known to walk his dog on the common. However, although police were convinced he was their man, there was no evidence to link him to the crime. In consultation with criminal profiler Paul Britton, police baited a honey trap. An attractive policewoman was recruited to contact Stagg and lure him into a relationship. Over a period of six months, the woman, known to Stagg as Lizzie James, sent him letters that detailed lurid sexual fantasies. Stagg responded in kind, desperate to keep the attention of such an attractive woman. But despite being fed leading questions, he never admitted any involvement in Rachel Nichols' murder. Nevertheless, police and an hysterically baying tabloid media considered Stagg the only suspect. The case reached the courts, but the judge refused to allow evidence from the Lizzie James investigation, calling it deceptive conduct of the grossest kind. The prosecution case fell apart, and Stagg was set free. Well, uh, the first time I was actually uh, arrested and released after three days, and my brother came round, and he said to me, uh, tell me honestly, uh, you didn't do it, did you? And I went, what? Because I actually got arrest, uh, charged with the uh, indecent exposure. And uh, he said, you didn't do the murder, did you? And I said, no, of course I didn't. You should know me by now. And that was the only time. And he, he's been behind me all the time. One last question. Um, you were, it seems to be, you were a victim of being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Um, An easy target, yeah. Did, I mean, did you know Rachel Nickel? Had you ever talked to her? No, never seen her before. Until I saw her in the newspapers, you know, when it happened. 
And so were you surprised when, when they came knocking at your door? Very surprised, yeah. And what, what's the first thing you're going to do now, finally? Well, once everything dies down, I'm going to go to the kennels where my do old dog is, get him out of there and get him back home and try to get back to my life. So I've always lived a quiet life and uh, all this is just too much for me, you know. So I just want to live my life with my old dog again. However, even after the trial, some police and many in the media believe Stagg was guilty until DNA testing in 2002 proved he couldn't have done it. Instead, convicted murderer Robert Knapper was committed for trial in November 2007, charged with the murder of Rachel Nichol. Fifteen years after being falsely accused of murder, Colin Stagg is to receive compensation from the British government of possibly up to a million pounds. But the man at the centre of one of the police force's most disreputable investigations said he's still not received a formal apology from the police. It's not everyone who can laugh off an assault charge. Following his guilty plea for hitting a hotel clerk with a telephone in June 2005, actor Russell Crowe returned to Australia to present awards at an Australian film ministry presentation night. Bringing a Bakelite telephone on stage with him, Crowe was happy to poke fun at his arrest. Because if there are any problems and you do get up here and go on too long, say hello to my little friend. The star got into hot water while he was in New York to promote his film, Cinderella Man, about American heavyweight boxing champ, James Braddock. But I tell you what, I had fun on this movie every day, regardless of the pain, regardless of, you know, the MRIs and the scans and the cortisone injections and the, and the physiotherapy, regardless of all of that stuff. Every single day on this movie, I was enjoying myself. Uh, I think that, you know, Braddock's legacy deserves um, the effort and I think he is a man who, you know, deserves the legacy. Crow was charged with assaulting 28-year-old concierge Nesta Estrada, who was treated in hospital for minor facial lacerations. Crow later settled a civil suit brought against him by Estrada for $100,000. Uh, he's charged with assault. Uh, this is arose because he was trying to get his wife on the phone in Australia. He was in his room. We gotta go, we gotta go. He, he couldn't get a line and there was a disagreement. Did he tell It'll work out. Crow's publicist said the actor brought a faulty telephone down to the hotel lobby because, despite repeated efforts, he'd been unable to get hotel staff to provide a replacement. The actor lost his temper, but the publicist said he threw the telephone at the wall and did not intend to hit Estrada. Crow later pleaded guilty and was put on a one-year good behavior bond without conviction, escaping the felony assault charge that could have seen him do jail time. Although the actor had a clean police record, the incident was the latest in a long line of violent bust-ups. Crow has carved out a reputation as a Hollywood hard man, both on screen and off. In November 2002, Scotland Yard officers were called to upmarket restaurant Zuma after reports of a brawl involving Crow and a fellow diner. And in 2004, the star admitted attacking his own bodyguard at a drinks party. The father of two young children, Crow said the telephone assault was the most shameful situation I've ever got myself in, and I've done some pretty dumb things in my life. Since then, the actor hasn't been involved in any further altercations and seems to have turned over a new leaf. to avoid being set back for trial. In 2004, Polanski sued the magazine Vanity Fair through the British courts, 
after it published an article that claimed the director has solicited a young woman for sex on his way to Sharon Tate's funeral. Giving evidence via video link from France, Polanski denied the allegations, saying they were the worst thing ever written about him and that they dishonored Tate's memory. Longtime friend Mia Farrow was amongst those who gave evidence in favor of Polanski. She told the High Court of his utter sense of loss at his wife's brutal murder. The 60-year-old star recalled a meeting with the film director at Elaine's restaurant in New York at the end of August 1969, the month 26-year-old Sharon Tate and her unborn child were slaughtered by Charles Manson's family. It was scalded on her mind, she told Mr. Justice Eady and a London jury. Sharon Tate's younger sister Deborah, who was 16 at the time of the murder, told the court she spoke to Polanski on the telephone in London after the tragedy. He was an absolute wreck, sobbing, weak in voice. I'm sure weak in physical body on the other side of the phone, she said. When she saw him when he came to Los Angeles, he was, she said, heavily sedated to the point where he couldn't walk without assistance. The magazine accepted that the incident did not happen on the way to the funeral, but argued it occurred about two friends. Polanski admitted to feeling rudderless in the years that followed, unable to form lasting relationships. In 1977, he was involved in an incident that was to overshadow his career and force him to flee the United States as a fugitive. Polanski became sexually involved with a 13-year-old actress of whom he was taking a series of photos to boost her career. He says it was consensual. She says it was rape. But in any case, Samantha Geimer was under the age of consent. The case went to court and Polanski accepted a plea bargain that saw him agree to plead guilty to a lesser charge of engaging in unlawful sexual intercourse with a minor. However, he discovered the judge intended to disregard the plea bargain in his sentencing, which could have seen him jailed for up to 50 years. Polanski fled to France where he was a citizen. As France has a policy of not extraditing its citizens to other countries, Polanski was not forced to return to the United States and resumed his filmmaking career. But he still constantly feels questions from the media about his legal problems. I came here to uh, talk about the motion picture that I presented. It. I've been uh, traveling around the world for 20 years. I don't have any problems. Thank you. However, the director does have to avoid countries that have an extradition agreement with the United States. Worst European atrocity since World War II and led to worldwide condemnation. But questions were raised about why the 600 Dutch peacekeepers in the area were unable to do more to help the Bosnian Muslims and why NATO aircraft could not provide the UN peacekeepers with better air support. By the end of the conflict, the entire Muslim population of Srebrenica had been deported or murdered by Serb forces. The International Court of Justice later classified the atrocity as an act of genocide. Ten years on, thousands of people attended a ceremony at Potokari Cemetery in Srebrenica to remember the victims of the massacre. 600 newly identified dead were to be buried after the formal commemorations. Amongst the mourners was British Foreign Secretary Jack Straw. For it is to the shame of the international community that this evil took place under our noses and we did nothing like enough. I bitterly regret this and I am deeply sorry for it. But the Foreign Secretary looked to the future and said a lasting peace between the different communities in the Balkans could be established. Tragically, ethnic hatred, mistrust and intolerance has long thrived too much in this region. And we have to create a lasting peace here by... This time on Crime Inc. Ten years on, the Srebrenica massacre. Ronnie Biggs on the run. The police honey trap that caught an innocent man. And Russell Crowe's phone rage. 
But first, Roman Polanski. Academy Award-winning director and actor Roman Polanski seems to have it all. A glittering career, beautiful wife, and a swag of the world's top awards for movie making. But behind the scenes lies a story of heartbreak and tragedy. The Polish-born director spent his early childhood on the run from the Nazis, only to discover after the war that his mother had perished in Auschwitz. In 1969, his wife Sharon Tate, who was seven months pregnant with their first child, was brutally murdered by Charles Manson's followers in a house in the Hollywood Hills. The event shattered Polanski, who blamed himself for being in London at the time. He attended her funeral supported by family and for weeks later. It claimed even if its defense failed, Polanski should not receive any damages as his reputation had already been affected by his 1977 conviction. However, Polanski was found to have been defamed and Vanity Fair was ordered to pay damages of 50,000 pounds. All that is necessary for the triumph of evil is that good men do nothing, said philosopher Edmund Burke. Never was that more evident than during the Srebrenica massacre, when the world sat back and allowed the slaughter of thousands of Bosnian Muslim men and boys in what was considered to be a United Nations safe area. Over just one week in July 1995, Serb paramilitary forces under the command of General Radko Miladic systematically murdered close to a quarter of the 40,000 strong Bosnian Muslim population. Soldiers and civilians, men and boys, were stripped of their personal identification and belongings and executed, their bodies hidden in secret mass graves. No one knows exactly how many people died in Srebrenica. Mass graves are still being uncovered and forensic experts examine the remains and attempt to identify the bodies. It was the